We're continuing with the Catholic Baroque in the countries of Spain, Flanders, and France. And I'm going to take one representative painter, one representative artist for each country, sort of the most famous artists from Spain and from Flanders and from France. That would be Velázquez for Spain, Peter Paul Rubens for Flanders, and Nicolas Poussin for France. So let's start with Diego Velázquez. Uh, he's a Spanish painter, and he starts out, he's painting very, he's what we might call the naturalistic Baroque. He's painting uh, sometimes even genre scenes, scenes of ordinary people doing ordinary things, such as here, the water carrier of Seville. And uh, it's just, you know, a man who is selling water on the streets of Seville. He's dressed in ordinary clothing. We have these wonderful, uh, great clay vessels uh, at which he's got the uh, textures down. It's a, a fairly simple painting. And then Velázquez became the court painter to the King of Spain. Much of his work for the King of Spain uh, and for the other aristocrats was portraiture. So you'll probably see more portraits by uh, Velázquez than any other type of art. He's very well known for his painterly technique with the very free and loose brushwork. And here you see a detail of the painting we're going to talk about, uh, Las Meninas, and it's the detail showing the painter painting. Uh, this is probably the most famous of all of Velázquez's paintings. It's a uh, over 10 foot high, uh, very large, uh, very tall painting, uh, now in the Museo del Prado in, in Madrid. And it's known as Las Meninas, uh, which means something like ladies in waiting, or as we often say, the maids of honor. Painted in 1656. Now, this is a fairly complicated painting uh, because you see all different levels of, uh, of meaning and, and interpretation just in how we should view it. So on one level, it's a painting of uh, the Infanta, uh, the Infanta is the little princess. Uh, you can be an Infanta and be very, you don't have to be an infant, you can be 80 years old and be the Infanta. Uh, here she isn't, she's a small child, and she has her own court, her own entourage, a retinue. Uh, as you see, she has is flanked by two ladies in waiting. Uh, behind one of them is her uh, duena or her, her, her governess or her nursemaid, perhaps. Uh, there's a man there, maybe he's her steward. Uh, and then we have in the foreground, in the right, uh, a dwarf. Uh, they had dwarves at the court of Spain. Um, it was supposed to be, I guess, prestigious to have these little people. And they could be the butt of jokes or they could be very witty themselves, that they, they could act as fools. Um, and of course, some people think they were terribly mistreated. Other people point out that uh, it's a much better life than begging on the street. Um, whatever, uh, here she is uh, small in stature, so she seems to be, uh, you know, it's appropriate that she could uh, be a kind of lady in waiting or a companion, more likely, uh, to the princess. The little boy next to her is uh, the page boy. And uh, he seems to be, uh, just not kicking, just putting his foot on the dog and sort of, you know, rubbing its back. Uh, the dog also is something that we often see in different uh, paintings of the, the royal family or the king sometimes, uh, because they evidently bred this type of dog, and so they do appear in, in many of the pictures. And then, of course, we've looked at the Infanta. Um, we see a figure coming through a door in the background. We see the painter, Diego Velázquez, painting a very tall picture. It's almost as though he is painting this painting and we're seeing it from the back, the stretched canvas. And he's looking out at us. Well, who is this viewer? Is the artist painting the Infanta, the little princess? And take a look at this detail. Uh, Presumably that's some kind of bow and lace 
that you see. And but all you see is the painterly brush strokes. And if you look at her garments, you know, there's satins, uh, there's the shimmer of the satin, but they're very loose brushwork. Uh, the child's hair is not showing with lots and lots of little lines. It's just this feathery feeling of a, a very a child with very wispy hair. Okay, so maybe it's a portrait of the artist painting the Infanta. Or maybe it's a portrait of the artist painting the King and Queen. And here we see them very diffuse uh, in the mirror that is on the back wall. Now, notice here you're looking at the whole thing, and you're seeing the mirror on the back wall. We just saw the detail of the king and queen reflected in it. So they would be standing where we're standing and looking at the painting. So is the idea uh, that we are the king and queen looking at it and we see our reflections and the artist is looking at us? So different ideas. One interesting fact about that mirror a painting that we've already seen in class was in the Royal Collection, a painting with a mirror in the background. What do you suppose that was? Yeah. The King of Spain owned the Arnolfini double portrait, uh, and it would have been inherited from Margaret of Austria's collection, which passed to the Royal uh, Collection in Spain. So it's possible that Jan van Eyck's painting uh, was the inspiration for this detail in Velasquez's painting. As you can see, mirror types have changed. Now this is a flat silvered mirror rather than the convex mirror we saw in the 15th century. It's also interesting that this painting alludes to different levels of reality. Now, it was very common to say that a painting was a that a painting was an imitation of reality. So in this picture, we see many paintings hanging on the wall. We also see the artist at work on another painting, which uh, is what? You have reality, and then you have that first imitation of reality. And then there's another kind of imitation of reality, the, the mirror. Is the mirror closer to reality than a painting? It's showing what's really out in the world. And then take a look at that man on the stairs. What it looks like is a man is you know, on the stairs, the door is open, um, you know, maybe he's, you know, come in to do something or to, to make an announcement. Uh, but at this time, there's sometimes were what we call trompe l'oeil paintings that imitated a stairway and people could hang, uh, not hang them, people would put them in their house so that the bottom was not a frame and it would be, uh, Something that you would say, oh, there's the staircase. I'll go upstairs, and you go over and find it was a painting, and you were you were you were just delighted at the uh, uh, the joke that had been played. Um, could it be that this is a painting of a man going up the stairs? Well, there's no way to know. It probably is supposed to be a painting of a man going up the stairs rather than a painting of a painting of a man going up the stairs. So you see what I'm talking about, different levels of reality. You have paintings of paintings. There's reality, there's painting, and then there is the painting of the painting. So it's like three steps away. Uh, so, you know, are you painting paintings? Are you painting reality? Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a delightful little puzzle in that sense. Okay, let's move to one of the most famous artists in history, uh, certainly one of the most famous uh, 17th century artists, uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And he is from Flanders, he lives in Antwerp, but he travels quite a bit. So I want to talk to you about Flanders in the 17th century. Now, I'm going to remind you of something, we've said this before at the very beginning of the course, but I need to remind you. We had talked about the Netherlands, the lowlands, including not just the country that today is the kingdom of the Netherlands, but also Belgium, which is the southern lowlands today. Now, in the 15th century, uh, the Burgundian dukes began ruling much of the Netherlands, both the southern and the northern Netherlands. Uh, some of the northern lowlands were ruled by counts and uh, you know, other principalities, but by and large, Burgundy had the uh, reign. Uh, by and large, the Duke of Burgundy was ruling most of the lowlands. 
And then by the 16, in the 16th century, the Duke Philip the Fair and his wife, the Spanish princess Joanna the Mad, a daughter of Ferdinand and Isabel, had a child. And that was Charles of Ghent. He was born in Ghent. And he became not only, you know, he not only had uh, Flanders to rule or, and the Net Lowlands to rule, uh, he inherited Spain from his mother. So he was the king of Spain. He had interests in Austria and Germany because he was elected Holy Roman Emperor. And his grandfather had been the Duke of Austria. And he also went out and conquered much of Italy. <laughs> so Charles of Ghent became the emperor. He was elected Holy Roman Emperor. He was elected emperor and he became the em Emperor Charles V, the uh, very famous Habsburg Emperor. So he's ruling Spain. Um, his aunt is the regent of the Netherlands. Uh, that was Margaret of Austria until she dies. And then uh, her niece, um, uh, Mary of Hungary, rules. And then after she retires, um, they send in the Duke of Alba, and he becomes the regent of the Netherlands. Well, by this time, Protestantism has, has come into being. And Calvin went and preached in the Netherlands, and he converted many people to Protestantism. Well, the Duke of Alba, Spanish uh, Duke, is uh, not in favor of this, and he calls in the Spanish Inquisition to stamp out this heresy, as they felt the Protestants were. And the result was religious war. And when the war was over, when the dust cleared, as we might say, an amazing thing had happened. The North Netherlands had separated themselves into a new kingdom. It's called the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and it's the country that today we call the Netherlands, and we use the adjective Dutch, and uh, we sometimes even call it Holland, uh, but it is the North Netherlands. And that was a new independent country, independent of Spanish rule. It became a Protestant nation with the Dutch Reformed Church as its state religion. Although, as we'll hear later, um, it was much more liberal about uh, not persecuting minority religions. Now, Flanders, the southern Netherlands, predominantly what is Belgium today, Flanders remained under Spanish rule and it remained Catholic. And, and to this very day, uh, Flanders is still a Catholic country. So Peter Paul Rubens uh, was a, uh, well, Peter Paul Rubens became a Flemish Baroque artist. Um, he got his mastership in Antwerp, and he lived in Antwerp. Uh, he has a very large house in Antwerp, which you can still visit. And he had a, well, we'll talk about the painting factory in a minute. Uh, but he also spent some time traveling. He worked for a lot of the crowned heads of uh, Catholic Europe. He spent eight years in Italy, uh, and he worked for the Duke of Mantua there. He had an international reputation. He worked for the courts of Mantua, for Spain, for France, and for England under the Stuart monarchs. So um, he did a lot of work. He also was a courtier and a diplomat. He's said to have been able to speak uh, about eight languages. Uh, he was ennobled twice. He was knighted, he was made a nobleman. Uh, when did he have time to paint? And with a, such a large out, outpouring of, of uh, works of art. Um, well, he was a really good businessman and he had what we sometimes call a painting factory with extensive workshop participation. Now, I want to explain how that worked. When we say a painting factory and extensive workshop participation, we're not 
quite talking about uh, apprentices doing the work. Rubens had what I mean today we might call independent contractors or specialists who could execute these paintings. These people were independent artists. They had reputations in their own right. And they would take the oil sketches that Rubens made and then ex make, blow them up, as it were, uh, execute them in, in a large scale. And in some cases, we do have the oil sketch and the finished painting. Now, some of these were people, I said, were specialists. Um, for example, there was Franz Snyder, who was Rubens' animal painter. Uh, there's a painting in Philadelphia uh, Museum of Art of um, Prometheus, and on the placard next to it, it says that it's by Rubens and Franz Snyder, because Franz Snyder uh, painted the eagle that is eating the liver of Prometheus. <laughs> um, Flower Bruegel, Jan Bruegel, a son of uh, Peter Bruegel the Elder, uh, known for his flower paintings, that's why they call him Flower Bruegel, was Rubens' flower painter. He paints other things besides flowers, but that was something he was very well known for. So Rubens would make these beautiful oil sketches very freely painted, hand them over to the workshop and uh, could go about his business. And then uh, if, the, if the contract said so, if the commission was important enough, he would, could then go on and go over the whole surface with his own brush strokes or just touch it up in places. But it was his concept and his approval that had to be reached before uh, this would be released as a Rubens. Uh, and incidentally, there wasn't anything underhanded about it because, I mean, everybody knew how he worked. Uh, and there had been a long tradition of apprentices and journeymen uh, creating works of art that had been uh, released under the name of the master. I mean, this was the tradition. Now, I'm showing you a, a work here that's not in your textbook. I wanted to do it because I thought, um, I know why they probably left out this kind of painting, because they were feeling that it was uh, maybe too, um, well, I'll explain in a minute. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to show you some things he's very famous for. He's very famous for his very painterly brush strokes. Uh, he's also famous for his lush, rich color, particularly the nuances of the flesh tones. And uh, here you uh, have a picture. It's known as the Rape of the Daughters of Leucippus. Uh, it is a classical mythological theme, and uh, Castor and Pollock would like to marry these young ladies. The dad said no, so they're abducting them um, and taking them off. Uh, and so you have these voluptuous female nudes. And some people look at it and say, but they're, they're fat. Well, you know, they're not really fat. That's our perception of, they're voluptuous. They're very sexy. Um, what you have to realize is that um, tastes in figure style um, vary. If you think back to Jan van Eyck and Eve, who had kind of skinny arms and legs and a swelling stomach and you know small round breasts, and then uh, you know you saw Titians where uh, people had put on more weight, uh, and then here with Rubens during the 17th century, uh, the the figures are much more robust. They have uh, uh, they are more they are fatter. <laughs> um, even in the 20th century, if you want to think, uh, you have. Uh, what, in the late 19th century, the Gibson girl with the hourglass figure is all <laughs> cinched into place. And then uh, you have, uh, the, during the 20s, you have this uh, uh, idea of the boyish figure of the girls where they're really sort of skinny and, and don't have too many breasts. I mean, don't have, don't have much in the way of breasts. Uh, and then during World War II, you have people like Betty Grable who are the pinup girls, and of course followed by Marilyn Monroe with, once again, the hourglass figure. Uh, and then they got the idea that women should somehow be very tall and athletic and slender and thin and have narrow hips and no stomach and big shoulders. Well, wait a minute, that's a man. So, you know, this, this more modern fashionable ideal uh, for women right now seems to be a male with breasts, which seems a little odd to me. Um, at any rate, with Rubens figures, and uh, in the 17th century, uh, you know, if you have got enough food to eat, you can put on some flesh and look voluptuous. The 
I wanted to talk to you about the, the, the colors. It's a little hard in a reproduction for you to see that. But on the women, he uses these pearly tones, uh, with sort of undertones of blues and pinks. And, and uh, uh, this, is, this is something he's very famous for, is the voluptuous female nude and the pearly tones of the skin. Um, so I thought we should include it. Uh, his compositions are dramatic and active, and there's a lot of diagonal movement in it, such as this work, which you will be responsible for because it is in the textbook, The Raising of the Cross. Uh, it was originally in uh, uh, the, ch the Church of St. Wallabugger, and uh, now it is in uh, the transept of the Cathedral of Antwerp. And in fact, there, it has a companion piece. It has another triptych, which is uh, the deposition or Christ being taken down from the cross, the descent from the cross. But here we're looking at an image of the raising of the cross. Now, you might think, well, why not just a crucifixion? Well, look at this. It's much more dramatic, isn't it? We have our strong diagonal movement uh, going clear through the, figure, the picture. Uh, with Christ on the cross. And we have all of these uh, muscular men, and of course, uh, this could be certainly the influence of Michelangelo, something he could have seen in Italy when he was there. Uh, all these muscular figures uh, trying to pull the uh, cross into place. Let's look at the uh, wings as well, the uh, side panels, which we call either wings uh, from the German flugel or uh, shutters sometimes with the side panels to the triptych. Uh, you'll notice if you look at the center pictures, you have, for example, on the right of the center, this man who is uh, one of the tormentors of, of Christ is pulling the cross up and his body is cut off. You know, we see his shoulders, but not the rest of his body. And we almost expect to see them, you know, extended beyond the uh, frame into the next, uh, the next section, into the next panel, but we don't. Uh, in the next panel, we have another man who's, who's cut off by the frame, as it were, uh, who's nailing uh, the uh, hands of uh, one of the thieves, the two thieves who were crucified with Christ. Uh, he's uh, attaching him to the cross. And so on that side, you have uh, the, the Romans, uh, Longinus, and the, uh, the two Thebes who are uh, also about to be crucified. Uh, and then on the other side, we have the holy people. We have Mary and John seated. Uh, we have Mary and John standing uh, in grief, holding hands. And then this uh, sort of right angle triangle of women who presumably are the holy women. Uh, we've seen them from all ages, however. Uh, presumably the, uh, one of them would be Mary Magdalene, uh, perhaps the one who uh, is at the apex of the, uh, the triangle there. And she looks very, very distraught. We have this old woman. Uh, we have uh, younger women uh, and even a baby. Um, and are these women are presumably the uh, uh, Mary Salome and uh, Mary Cleothus. But, uh, you know, it's, it's unusual to see a baby uh, with the holy women, to be perfectly frank. You've got actually like two children there. Okay, let's all look at the center. We've said that they have this active, dry, dramatic diagonal of the cross being raised up. Uh, you have not quite tenebroso, it's not that dark, uh, but you do have a strong light-dark uh, contrast. You have, do have a strong light-dark contrast. And you have a lot of activity going on. Uh, you see this dog here, you can almost hear the dog barking. Uh, and uh, uh, Christ is looking up to heaven. Uh, Christ himself is a very muscular figure, and once again, uh, we cite uh, the probable influence of Michelangelo, uh, who of course was, uh, had an international reputation of his own, but remember, Rubens was down in Italy. He didn't have to stay in Mantua. He probably could have gone somewhere and seen uh, paintings by other artists, uh, including uh, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, Caracci, uh, you know, all of the you know, famous artists. This is what we often call an open composition. And by that we mean that some of the uh, compositions seem to go out over the edge, such as this, this the man whose body we think should be extended out of the edge, or the dog who we don't see his rear end or his tail. That's over the edge of the picture, as though um, there was more to the scene, but we're just not showing it in the picture. 
Uh, we also see, of course, that strong emotion, with uh, a particular on Christ's face. Rubens had a uh, commission from Marie de Medici. Uh, Marie de Medici was the uh, daughter of the Duke of Florence, and she was the Queen of France. She had married the King of France, Henri IV, and um, he died. But she had done what a queen is supposed to do. She had, she had born a male child who was now the heir to the throne of the, King of, of the Kingdom of France. But uh, you can imagine there's a lot of um, politicking and backbiting and, and stuff going on. Um, she becomes the regent of France. And of course, there are people who don't think a woman should be, and they you know, want to take it away from her. So there's a lot of, a lot of problems. But essentially, uh, to show what a wonderful ruler she was, uh, Marie de Medici uh, commissioned a whole set of paintings of her life story from Rubens. And um, it's kind of interesting because she's doing sometimes fairly ordinary things. You know, she's, she's being born, uh, <laughs> or she's a young girl. Um, she, for example, there's one picture where she has arrived in Marseille. She's coming to marry the king, uh, and she's stepping off the boat. What a ma magnificent thing to walk down the gangplank and step off the boat. But there are classical figures there, and there is dramatic uh, composition and, and uh, lighting. So here we're going to see one of those pictures. Um, that really glorify Marie de Medici. And the way they do it is by incorporating classical deities into the picture. You know, this makes it a, a lofty picture and it, you know, it suggests uh, what, I guess you could say that she's got friends in high places, in this case, Jupiter and Juno. Um, but at any rate, let's look at this and see how we're showing this picture. Uh, the picture is the king, Henri, is receiving the portrait of Marie de Medici. You'll remember that most marriages uh, of kings and, and, and queens are, and, and dukes and you know, basically aristocrats uh, or anybody with some money, are arranged marriages, especially, of course, for kings. Um, and they often are diplomatic. You want ties with another country, uh, so you marry uh, the daughter of or the sister of the king of that country, or in this case, the duke. But most kings don't want to marry somebody that they haven't got a clue what they look like. You know, okay, your kingdom is important, but I want to see if uh, you're going to be personable enough, that you're going to be pretty enough uh, to be queen. Um, and you may remember, I think I told you that uh, Jan van Eyck did uh, portraits of Isabella of Portugal that were sent back to the Duke of Burgundy. And after he saw those, he said, yes, I'll marry her, <laughs> and uh, did. Um, some of you may know about Henry VIII, uh, that uh, uh, Hans Holbein went and painted a picture of a, a Flemish uh, daughter of the Duke of Cleves. And uh, Henry liked the painting all right, but he did not like the woman herself. He, uh, I guess she was too big boned and, and uh, just wasn't what he expected. Uh, in this case, we have Rubens has painted a portrait of Marie de Medici, which is included in the overall picture. He's painted this portrait of her. And the king sees the portrait and he says, oh yes, you know, I'm going to marry that woman. She's, you know, most attractive. <laughs> okay, so who are all these other people? Well, first let's point out a few things. The king is wearing a breastplate. And in the background of this landscape, you can see a burning city. The king was engaged in warfare. Uh, you do see, however, that his uh, helmet and uh, shield and, uh, are down there on the font, and they're being played with by little, with little putti. We're going to come back to them. Uh, the putti here are little loves, uh, because the subject of this whole picture, of course, is love and marriage. Uh, even if it is a diplomatic marriage, uh, putting a, a sheen on it. 
At the top, you see Jupiter and Juno holding hands, looking very affectionate. Well, if you know mythology, they weren't that affectionate. But here they are, pre as, as king and queen of heaven, uh, you know, they are presiding over and giving their blessing to this impending marriage. Juno, of course, was the classical goddess of marriage, was one of the classical goddesses who presided over marriage. And of course, we can tell very clearly that they're Juno and Jupiter because of the birds that are next to them. Uh, up in this upper left corner with the talons is the eagle of Jupiter. And here we see the peacock of Juno. And I want you to notice the, the, the clothing, how there's a sheen uh, to, the, to the garment, as though uh, this uh, beautiful uh, golden garment, which is, is Artemisia gold, uh, is, is a satin. And of course, uh, Rubens and many other artists are just very, very good at showing the stuffs, the, the sheen of satin and the different textures of the very rich cloths that uh, uh, the aristocrats, or in this case, uh, the, the deities of ancient Rome could be wearing. Um, and we look further down and we see who is holding this, who is delivering this portrait uh, to the king. It's, it's not a, a messenger on earth, uh, it's two classical deities. Uh, the older one is Hymen, uh, the god of marriage. And then you have a little baby, Cupid, Cupid, the god of love. And it, he looks like he's pointing out the excellent features of the queen, doesn't he? And obviously, uh, the king is very, very struck, you know, uh, with, her, with her portrait. Um, who is whispering in his ear? Well, it, first, it looks like it might be Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, because she often wears a helmet. Uh, but actually, this figure has been identified as a personification of France. So I like to think of it as France with some of the attributes of wisdom. And she seems to be counseling the king, as though she's whispering in his ear, oh, yes, it'd be very good to marry her. Yes, this would be a very wise thing to do for France. And remember those uh, little pooty playing with the the shield and the helmet and the burning city in the background. The king has been great engaged in war, but now the message is that the queen will bring peace and prosperity uh, because with the softening influences of love, with the little arrows figures, the little, little putti, the little uh, 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 helpers of Cupid, uh, the little loves, uh, they are just making the, war, the warlike armor into a play device. So it's a little bit like make love, not war. Incidentally, those uh, little putti is actually a kind of um, a reference or a quotation of a, a Botticelli painting of Mars and Venus where you have little baby satyrs uh, playing with uh, Mars, the god of war's uh, uh, armor. And it, the idea, once again, is love, Venus, has overcome Mars. So here uh, is a uh, you know, not only is she very beautiful, uh, but she's going to be very, very good for France because uh, she will be a softening influence and there will be peace. And here I have a classical deity, so maybe I should rearrange these because I talked about them first. Okay. Uh, yeah, and here we can have the putti frolicking with the armor, which I just said. You'll just have to attach it to that particular picture. Um, you have what, diagonal movement, uh, fairly dramatic poses, very free brushwork, rich colors, and shimmering textures. Okay, now let's go to France. Um, I should tell you that Nicolas Poussin actually spent a lot of his time in Italy, but France claims him as their leading, uh, probably most famous, Baroque painter. If Rubens exemplifies the exuberant Baroque, the Baroque Baroque, you know, who is more Baroque than Rubens? Uh, Poussin exemplifies the classical Baroque. And although they didn't include any in your textbook, uh, he is most famous for painting religious and mythological paintings. Here we have the rape of uh, the Sabines. It's the, the, a founding story of Rome or how the Romans got their wives. Um, but you can see that things are very dramatic here, and yet if you start looking at individual groupings, uh, you see a lot of uh, groups of figures that are actually uh, triangular, that device we remember from Renaissance art, a way to order your composition. So he may have dramatic forms, uh, but he, he keeps them orderly. 
Uh, classical Baroque, you'll remember, we said with the uh, uh, Karachi, often uh, wants to take Renaissance devices and perhaps make them more lifelike. And so this is what we're seeing in these landscapes that are in your textbook. Uh, landscapes by Poussin, and they're landscapes with St. Matthew and St. John the Evangelist. Now, we sometimes call these classical landscapes. Uh, certainly there are uh, classical buildings in the background, particularly uh, you can see in the, uh, uh, the background of St. John the Evangelist. Uh, there are classical ruins in the foreground of both of them. And these Roman ruins uh, sort of set off a spacious vista going back into the background. The figures are relatively small in relationship to the entire uh, scene. Now, landscape becomes very, very important during the Baroque period. Um, a classical landscape harks back to the idea of we really need to have a figure in here. And so, we do, we have the excuse for the landscape is uh, two saints. Uh, so they're present, but once again, here we have this idea uh, in the 17th century of, of landscape being, uh, becoming much, much more important than it was, for example, in the 16th century. One of the other characteristics of what we sometimes call the classical landscape, uh, classicizing perhaps, uh, is they're using a device that we also saw in Renaissance art uh, to show spatial uh, recession. You have a very clear foreground, middle ground, background. Uh, and in fact, you have planar recession. So you have uh, a, 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 the foreground figures are as though they were in one plane. And then say that clump of trees uh, is further back, still parallel to the picture plane. Uh, the, the buildings and the ruins in the background and the mountains, uh, another plain far in the distance. The figures in the foreground show St. Matthew, the author of the first gospel, the gospel of St. Matthew. Uh, and with him is an angel. And uh, you'll remember we talked about the angel with, uh, of St. Matthew with Caravaggio. The angel is the symbol of St. Matthew uh, and here, it's almost as though he's the consultant. Uh, so he's a, a way of showing divine inspiration. Uh, the, uh, the saint looks to him, and the uh, angel's looking down at what he's reading as though he's, you know, he's, he's approving it. <laughs> an angel is an editor, perhaps. This painting is called The Landscape with St. John on Patmos. Uh, Patmos, of course, was the island at which St. John was exiled. And while on the island of Patmos, he had an apocalyptic vision. Um, we've heard of that before. He had the vision of the end of the world and the four horsemen and all of these events that uh, will kill off all of mankind. And yet we look at this landscape and it's absolutely calm and peaceful. And, you know, if he's, if he's writing... The Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, uh, he's certainly calm about it. <laughs> We're not seeing him in a, a dramatic uh, uh, throes of having the vision. I keep wondering about that because what it looks like is he could be writing the Gospels, but the tradition was that uh, St. John wrote the Gospels when, uh, the Gospel of St. John when he was 99 years old. Um, well, Take it for what it is, whether it's the Apocalypse uh, or he's writing the Gospel of St. John. It is a beautiful example of the classical landscape with uh, buildings in the middle ground uh, that, uh, or the, the, I guess you could say the, uh, just before the far background, the background, buildings in the background, uh, obelisk, uh, a round building, which uh, seems to be related to the, um, Castello San Angelo, which is the tomb of Hadrian in Rome, and uh, not on Patmos in Rome. Uh, and then you have, of course, all these ruins in the foreground. And if you look at the way the, the painting is laid out, uh, you have this uh, great plinth that is parallel to the picture plane. And it's about the same plane where John is parallel to the picture plane in profile, stretched out. And then each of these rocks 
or trees uh, is parallel to the picture plane. It seems to uh, uh, go back into space a little more, uh, back into space a little more. It leads us back through the vista, through the landscape, back into space. But there are so many things that are parallel to the picture plane that is essentially a measured recession into space. Of course, the buildings are parallel. And then, of course, in the distance, the mountain. This all suggests balance, order, uh, the things that artists who uh, are very interested in, uh, say, the High Renaissance, uh, but now uh, you know, more emphasis on landscape in this case. Uh, but some of the same devices that we saw used in the Renaissance do continue to be used.